Hello and welcome to my thoughts on Season 1 of Star Trek The Next Generation. For those of you who do not know, I uh, fairly recently put out a video talking about how I watched through all of Star Trek The Original Series in 2023 and how that held up in my estimations. And then I watched through all of the original series era or original series crew uh, movies. So Star Trek's one to six. I am watching through uh, potentially all Star Trek content in order of release. But I didn't realise until I watched all of the Star Trek one to six movies that a few of them were made after Next Generation began. But it's fine. It's fine. Everything is fine. It made for a better video. Anyway, Star Trek The Next Generation. This is the show that would sometimes be on in the background uh, of my house when <laughs> the background of my house when I was growing up in the 90s uh, and I have some vague memories of of Picard and Worf and Data and you know an episode where they were doing some ship to ship combat you know the, the usual stuff but in vague childhood memory form I don't think I ever paid it full attention I definitely didn't find it interesting. I remember sometimes looking up at the TV, uh, usually it'd be when we were eating dinner, and I'd be like, ah, oh, Star Trek's on. <laughs> Why isn't The Simpsons on? Oh, how times change. Also probably worth noting is that I had previously watched the first uh, 13 episodes, I believe. It looks like those 13. About two years ago when I was like, I'm gonna watch Star Trek The Original Series. That's boring. I'm gonna watch Star Trek The Next Generation. That's boring. Uh, and obviously here we are now. Anyway, enough preamble. What did I think about the bloody thing? Well, I love it. Obviously, I have said in the uh, Original Series video that I am going to miss the Original Series crew, and I do, and the Next Generation crew is definitely a different crew, they have a different dynamic. Picard is an older captain, for starters. They have some different rules, so he doesn't go down to planets very often. We don't have Spock. Spock is dearly missed. We have Data, who feels very much like the stand-in for Spock in terms of, you know, emotional dissonance. But I love them... maybe not equally, I do really really love Spock. But so far I do really love the Next Generation crew and their adventures. One of the biggest like, whoa, we're in the future now moments for me, is the legroom. Oh my god, the bridge has so much legroom now, it makes the original series bridge look so cramped. There's room to move about, room to lean on railings when you're talking to people, to lean against walls. You know, there's less people running around on the bridge. I haven't noticed any yeomans in this version of Star Trek. There's less people in general on monitors. There's like a row of like four monitors, I want to say, at the back. And there are people occasionally on them. But, um, you know, it's 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 just less crowded on the bridge in general, and I like it that way. I do wonder sometimes what those people are doing there on the computers on the bridge. Like, what is it that they can only do on the bridge in terms of accessing the computer terminals? And how do they get so involved in their work that when the ship is under literal attack, they still remain in the background, just calmly tapping away on their keys <laughs> as if nothing is happening. I would at the very least be turned around and watching the events unfolding before me. I mean, I get it, I know that they're there for visual flair, you're not really supposed to think about them too much, but my brain doesn't work that way, fam. Whenever something is added for cosmetic flair that has potential lore implications, I'm more concerned about the potential lore implications than the cosmetic flair. Shall we go through the crew? Okay, because Picard. I really like Picard. <laughs> I'm not just gonna go through every crew member and go, I really like them. I love Picard because whereas Kirk is young and charismatic and takes lots of risks and stuff, Picard is a lot more uh, awkward and a little bit more... I don't want to say conservative because that word has gross connotations. He's a little bit more measured in his risk assessment, I think. He's got this whole emotionally unavailable thing going on, which um, is always fun when they finally uh, actually pay it off, probably sometime in season seven, I don't know. Just kiss the doctor, man. I really like Riker. He feels like the Kirk of this series, and I kind of have a suspicion that that was the plan all along. That they kind of wanted to do a show of Kirk's younger years before he became a captain. What was Kirk like as a, a, a first officer? I remember the terms. You know, Riker is the one who is young and 
and headstrong and attractive and and uh, I just got distracted by a, by a Discord boop. Don't mind me. I've already mentioned that data feels like the step in for Spock, but it's not. I think it's done well. It's not like they were just like, okay, we need a Vulcan. Uh, they're actually trying something new here. The emotional. Because I said emotional dissonance earlier. I don't really know how to quantify it, but the 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 thing about data not having access to emotions is slightly different to Spock having emotions and suppressing them or you know feeling like the Vulcan way of logic is it's less of a choice and it's more of like this is how I'm made and there's lots of really fun slightly more modern science fiction takes on Data as an android and what that means for him as someone who seems to be pretty damn sentient. I really like Geordie LaForge with his whole blindness thing where he talks about wearing the visor constantly causes him pain but he does it because it's the only way he gets to see in any particular way and pursue his dreams of working on a starship and it's, it's a really cool character trait. I think uh, more so than in the original series every single member of the next generation has like fully fleshed out lore and like like an original feeling backstory a unique trait that they bring to the crew like scotty he, uh, he was great but he, he he was scottish that was his trait anyway i really like dr beverly crusher and i'm going to break the illusion a bit and let you know that i have seen episode one of season two when recording this and it seems like she's moved on and that bums me out hopefully she'll be back i imagine she'll be back but i don't want to know in what capacity i'll get to it nobody bloody told me that tasha bloody yard dies what the bloody heck so what is it called the the sliver of evil or whatever that episode i had already watched like three episodes that day and it was like 2 a.m and i was like i should really go to sleep but i'm really not tired so fuck it one last star trek episode to go to sleep and boy did i choose an episode now unfortunately i i do work with people who don't exist in the realm of i shouldn't spoil shows for people so they said to me oh that's right yeah they do recycle her at some points but that would be spoilers so and then they walked off i was like okay i guess I guess I have not been spoiled about the fact that Tasha Yar reappears later in the series. But to be honest, I was kind of hoping they would mine that grief because this... Uh, before I move on, are there any crew members I'm forgetting oh wesley oh shut up wesley now wesley's great because he's got this um he's got this prophesized future of being a really important human being in terms of scientific knowledge uh which was a way to phrase that sentence now i actually enjoy wesley i feel like he probably has a bit of a reputation for being the idiot kid on the bridge or whatever but no nah, i like him he's great keep him around like for the first few episodes he's in he does have that immature spark of what do these buttons do and he is a bit of a nuisance but he he wisens up pretty damn quickly when he's made a um, acting ensign. Oh, Worf. Have I talked about Worf? They haven't really done much with Worf yet. He did get one episode, um, but it's really interesting having a Klingon member of a crew and... This is going to be a really random bit of knowledge, but apparently he's really fucking good in season three of Picard. Like, he's like the comedic relief or whatever. So I'm looking forward to seeing how that develops. Like, I don't expect him to become a clown over the course of Next Generation. That's probably not something that's even Next Generation focused. Um, but um, there has already been allusions to him developing a sense of humour. And I, I like that for him. I like the whole Klingon raised by humans thing he's got going on. It's it's interesting. And Councillor Troy. Sorry, there was a fairly robust cast. So, um, but yeah. Councillor Troy, I'm not going to lie. She's probably, like, the least interesting one for me personally. Although, I do like an empath. And I do find her interesting. I just think, especially in her earliest episodes... She was overused as like a, what is this person feeling? Oh, I'm feeling what this person is feeling. What is this person feeling? Oh, I am feeling what this person is feeling. You know, it's like, okay. They they did make it a little bit more nuanced as the series went on, but I didn't have a great first impression of her. But she's nice. She's cool. She's friendly. I like her. Anyway, now I can talk about what I really like about The Next Generation that the original series doesn't do. And this is 
I think primarily because of the eras in which each show was made, but the original series back in the 60s couldn't have any overarching stories because there was no such thing as box sets, there was no such thing as on demand. You could only see the episodes as they aired, so if you missed a few, then you were left to dry in terms of storytelling, and that's still very much a thing here. It's still very much adventure of a week, but what I absolutely love about The Next Generation is it has character development and it has plot development and world development. The thing I loved the most about the original series cast, crew, era, whatever, movies, Star Trek's 1 to 6, was that it took a very static world and then developed it and gave it a sequential plot. And it's really exciting to see the next generation also have this, at least on a smaller level. But you have plots such as the conspiracy episode being set up in advance. Uh, you've got Wesley's future being laid out ahead of him as a really promising Starfleet uh, science officer. You've got Tasha Yar fucking dying. And one more thing I have been spoiled on, but this was back in an era before I cared about Star Trek. I do know that Picard gets messed up by the Borg at some point and then there's a whole like post Borg trauma thing he has going on later. And I just adore this. I just adore this version of Star Trek where there are consequences to adventures. There's obviously mostly going to be adventures of a week episodes, but um you can you can actually play with this universe and the characters in it in a meaningful way. And they can change and they can grow and they can fucking die. Although I know Picard exists, so I don't really expect anyone to die permanently. I don't know the cast, but I have seen the picture of all of their older versions sitting on the bridge of the Enterprise at the end of season three. I just don't remember if Tasha Yar is there or not, which is pretty fortunate for me. But yeah, to quickly talk about some standout episodes, I really liked how The Naked Now was a sequel to The Naked Time in the original series. It really felt like it rewarded me for starting with the original series. I've kind of got this lore in the back of my head now of what things were like a hundred years ago and how events can come back around a hundred years later. Um, I liked Where No One Has Gone Before, which was the episode which introduced us to the being which told Picard about Wesley Crush's promising future. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to say I loved this episode, but the Justice episode was certainly a ride when uh, <laughs> when Worf was given a line, something along the lines of, I can't make love to human women because I have to be too gentle <laughs> or something weird like that. Oh, Q. How do I feel about Q? Q is very campy. Q feels like a modern version of what was previously just a type of episode in the original series where they would come across this almost supernatural, super intelligent being with a childlike, impish, peevish behaviour which would endanger the crew. They have taken that theme of episode and turned it into a recurring character called Q. And I also happen to know that Q recurs not just in this series but in Voyager as well because I might have peeked at a wiki page. I'm sorry, I'll stop doing that. Um... <laughs> And I think he's in Picard as well. But these things actually make me excited to keep watching. I wouldn't ever seek them out because I think it's too dangerous in terms of getting spoiled. But it does actually uh, make me go, ooh, how does that play out? Anyway, I don't love Q so far. Um, but, you know, I guess he's got time to grow on me, hasn't he? Oh, uh, the holodeck. I love the holodeck and all episodes related to the holodeck. It's such a fun concept of, like, these people are basically real, but they've literally only just been fabricated and they don't know that they're not real. Like, at the end of The Big Goodbye, I think it is, where where the guy's like, is, am I going to exist? Like, am I real? And the guy's like, I honestly don't know. <laughs> and it's like, oh, shit, that's kind of ethically messed up, but they're going to keep using the holodeck. I guess it's fine. As I already mentioned, I really liked Skin of Evil for what it did. Uh, in terms of killing Tasha Yar. I'm going to miss her. I, hope, well, I mean, I know she kind of comes back, but hopefully she comes back in an interesting capacity, which allows for her character. I'm just thinking now, like, what if Data tries to create an android version of her? I don't think that's within his capacity, but it could be interesting. Um, with a show like Star Trek, I do have concerns about bringing characters back because... It's sci-fi is in the plausibility range and uh, a lot of the time and I worry about bringing characters back to life should be as difficult as it was with Spock. Also, I really loved 
conspiracy and uh i really enjoyed the the unfold humans in the neutral zone which is the final episode of this season just this idea of um being able to see this world through the eyes of the people who actually watch the show and then the characters of a show being able to see the people who uh, like the kinds of people who watch the show uh, through the eyes of them in in the show, I <laughs> explain that so poorly, but I actually do not have time to do another take because I'm due on a Dimension Jam live stream in about seven minutes. But if I didn't make this video now, my thoughts would not be fresh. Anyway, I'm gonna leave it there. We're not gonna go too in detail, um, but you know, I'm gonna miss Beardless Riker. <laughs> because I'm not a beard guy. Anyway, uh, that's my last closing thought. I just waved at the screen. You couldn't see me wave at the screen. I am so intelligent and clever and smart. Thank you so much for watching this video. And I, my plan is to come back and do a thoughts on of season two and then season three and four and five and six and seven. But I'm slightly concerned that there won't be enough particular plot developments or things to differentiate between season two and season one to really justify a thoughts on season two but i think we'll see how we go we'll probably do a thoughts on season two because we've already started with a thoughts on season one anyway i will catch you in the next one that's i still don't know how to end videos and i've been doing this for fucking years